Hey, welcome back to Way of the Wrench, and on today's very special episode, I'm going to be attempting my very own do-it-yourself lockdown bar, and I'm going to try to do this without any kind of welding so that you guys at home can do the same thing for your virtual pinball cabinets. So, let's go figure this out. Cool, the clamp and the form are ready to go. Now, traditionally when you're doing hammer forming, you're gonna put a couple bolt holes through this, probably about three or four for something this size, and something around like quarter inch by 20 kind of bolts. And some washers on both sides that we can bolt and sandwich this together through your piece. Now, we don't want those holes in this lockdown bar. About the only thing you maybe could get away with is if you're putting a center fire button in your lockdown bar, then you could put a bolt and, and go through that hole. But on mine, I don't want to put that fire uh, button, so I don't want any holes. So what I'm going to try to attempt, and you're going to find out pretty quick whether this works or not, is I'm going to just clamp the crap out of this with as many C-clamps as I can, maybe even a vise. And instead of just hammering away on one side, and maybe the sheet metal gets pulled out when I do that, I'm going to do a little bit on this side, a little bit on this side, a little bit on all four sides, and hopefully that will kind of lock it in place. Uh, that way it doesn't move around. So now we got to cut our metal. In order to figure out the dimensions of the sheet metal piece that you need to cut, we got a couple things we got to do. First up is measure your pieces, obviously. So this is going to be three inches and one sixteenth. And then I want one inch down in the actual finished part. Now that sounds like it should be just four and one sixteenth. However, that's with a straight line measurement without figuring out any kind of bend radius and what the metal's gonna wanna do based off its thickness and the material it is. So one of the things you can do is you can go online and look up a sheet metal bend radius calculator and then plug in all the info and it will tell you how long or how short your piece should be adjusted based off of what you're putting in. So let's take a look. So this one here is from gasparini.com and it shows you a little diagram of what dimensions they're asking to input. And the first one it's asking is angle, so we're making a 90, so put that in. And then side A, we're gonna call this the short one, and it's in millimeters, so you just have to convert it over. So for one inch, that's gonna be 25.4 millimeters. And then side B is the longer one if we're doing the width of our lockdown bar, so you're gonna figure out what three inches and 1 16th is and put it into millimeters there. And then a K factor, it automatically plops a 0.3 in there. The K factor you can look up on a separate chart. 0.3 is generally gonna be kind of like softer materials and the harder or bigger bends that you're gonna do in metal, that K factor goes up. But you have to look that up on a separate chart. And then it's asking what the internal radius is. So remember we did a quarter inch uh, radius with that round over bit, so that's 6.35 mil. And then the thickness of the sheet metal, just convert your 19 gauge down to millimeters, which in this case is one. Press calculate, and then it will tell you what the bend deduction is and what the length should be overall. So if I was to add up 25.4 and 101.2 to make up the just what I measured dimensions, that's gonna be 126.6 mil is what I should cut out. However, down here it is suggesting that it should be 122.35 mil. We can round that up probably to 0 0.5. So I have to knock off roughly four millimeters. And so what's happening is that radius is a lesser distance for the metal to go down. So if we don't cut it down that four mil, we're gonna have four mil lower uh, or lengthened on one of the dimensions. So this is just a, another way of um, figuring out what kind of sheet metal size that you need to cut. Using that online bend calculator, I only had the one bend going this way, so I'm gonna end up cutting the sheet metal 99 millimeters this way. However, when I'm going this way to figure out that length, there's actually two bends. There's one on the left and the right. So what I basically did is I took two parts of the top, right? It's called one piece saying it was 26 inches long and had the one inch and figured that out. And then on the other end, I just called it three quarters of an inch that had a one inch bend and then added the two together and that gave me 722 millimeters for the length. So now it's time to go figure out how we're gonna cut the metal. Right now for cutting your 19 gauge mild steel sheet metal, Probably the easiest way for most of you is you have to go get this from a local metal supplier anyway, so why don't you just tell them the exact dimensions you need and they will cut it for you. There might be a very, very small cut fee that they add for that, but it's gonna be really minor considering how big your piece is. Now, if you have a bunch of sheet metal, the probably best tool for this would be to use a foot shear. Uh, if you don't have a shear, which probably most of you don't, 
but you can get your hands on some metal is grab one of these uh, zip discs, these cutting grinding discs. They come in about 40 thousandths thickness or like 1 16th and then uh, throw it in one of these grinders and you can use that. Just lay out your line, hang the sheet metal over the edge of the table and make sure you're using your guard and don't put your hands in front holding the metal so that way if this catches it doesn't grind your fingers off and just follow the line really carefully and that'll make the cut as well. When I put the sheet metal on top of the form and then put the clamp on just to kind of get a rough idea how we're going to set this up, a couple things kind of pop up here. First one is I can't really see where this is positioned based off of where the form is underneath because the sheet metal's in the way. Now normally you would have holes in here that are laid out and drilled through everything so that that all lines up, but we don't want holes in this part, so we have to figure out something else. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to make a center line here and a center line on the bottom and that way at least from the end I can line it up and from the other end and from the halfway point on the sides as well so that we can kind of line this up before we clamp it. Now the other thing is there's only about an inch sticking out here and an inch sticking out here that's going to get folded down. This is more like an inch and a half right to this tip here so I'm kind of thinking if we kind of pre-radius this a little bit that there'll be less to grind off after it's all bent up. So let's do that now. You're going to want to take a file and deburr all the sharp edges and go all the way around and on both sides before you hammer form because it's a lot easier when it's flat. Now when you go to set this up you can see those center lines are helping line up the clamp to the center of the metal to the center of the form and that's placing both the left and right clamp in the exact same position over top of this so that this will get the same amount of bend. And then this form is not supposed to be in the center of where this form is but we do want the sheet metal right to the edge of the front of the form so that's where that is and then this is supposed to be three quarters of an inch in is where that angle starts. So just take a ruler make sure that both left and right sides are set at three quarters of an inch and then you're ready to clamp. Now here comes the tricky part. Because we are not doing the traditional holes and bolts through the parts, we have to use these C-clamps and the C-clamps are going to introduce a bunch of problems. The first one is how many of these do we actually need to be able to clamp this and stop this metal from moving? I think one, two, three, maybe even four clamps is not enough. I would say six or seven clamps. And because we are not putting a solid bolt through a hole through the metal to positively make sure that this metal doesn't move, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit here on this end and a little bit there and a little bit here and a little bit there to try to kind of lock it in place so it doesn't want to move before uh, I just hammer all on one side and get it to shift. Now the other thing is because we are using C-clamps, do we clamp the material together, sandwich it all together, or do we clamp it to a table? And then the third one is this is going to introduce some problems where you can't actually get a hammer in there because this frame of the C-clamp is in the way. So once you've got six, seven of these clamps set up, uh, you do what you can and then when you need to get around this, you may have to take one off at a time, hammer form a little bit, put it back on, take another one off. And that's going to take a lot of extra time, but uh, I think it's required because we don't have those bolts going through the parts. So I think you're going to see what I do and uh, Hopefully everything goes well. Fingers crossed.
So as I was hammering down the tapered side at the front, I got it right down to where it was and I noticed that it wasn't moving at all. So maybe these clamps are doing the trick. However, uh, I gotta do the other side now. So I think if we just move these clamps to the other side and we just keep an eye on this piece of sheet metal, if it starts to pull away, then we gotta do something different. But if it doesn't, then I think this is just gonna work out perfect. So flip the clamps over, let's do the other side and work out these corners on the ends as well. In these corners here, I can't just go 90 here on the end and then 90 on this side. Otherwise the corner is gonna have a huge tuck or a pucker where it's bulged up. So what I need to do is shrink the amount of metal that's here in the corner to make it go down around that curve. So what you do is anytime you see the metal starting to bulge up or pucker, or they call it a tuck, you have to keep hammering those tucks down as they appear so that you can get this to go smooth. So I've got the end done in the front, but you can see these corners are starting to tuck pretty hard. And uh, this tuck right here is the seam that you wanna try to keep down. You don't wanna make these things too big and you definitely don't wanna fold it over on itself. So just keep hammering on the ridges of the tuck and try to get it to go down. You'll notice that when you hammer on the tuck that the side bulges a bit, you just have to kind of keep going back and forth. And this will take you some time to get this down. Now, I don't know how perfect it's gonna be. And keep in mind that probably about you know this much here is gonna get cut off anyway when we clean up the bottom. So it's almost tempting to kind of cut some of that off now to see if that will help with this. But I'm gonna try for a couple minutes more here and see if not, I'm gonna cut the excess off here and, and try again. Well, that sucks. Disaster strikes. This corner has absolutely cracked. And I thought it was maybe just, maybe I did the tucks too tight on this side, so I tried the other side, it cracked too. So why is that? Well, my guess is there is just too much shrinkage that's happening here that we're trying to get it to do and it just can't do it. So maybe this radius needs to be bigger. Um, or the only other way we could salvage this part is finish it up, take it out of here, grind it, clean it, polish it, and wherever the crack is, we could either weld it up and grind it back, and that would be actually pretty good. So for me, someone who's got a welder, that would be pretty good. Uh, otherwise, this is probably could be filled in with epoxy and then sanded smooth, so you could still salvage the part. Um, but that sucks. So tempted to make another one after making a bigger radius, but uh, yeah, that sucks. Taking a look at the hammer form after the fact, and you know, I'm always trying to learn from my mistakes and get better for the next time. Even though I made this out of hardwood, you can see that the tucks, uh, when they were trying to get hammered out, they kind of just sank right into this hardwood and uh, weren't able to get hammered out. So this might have been part of the problem as well. Be interesting to know if this was made out of steel, if I would have been able to get those tucks out without it cracking. But I still think it's uh, an issue with this radius being too tight. All right, taking this thing out of the hammer form, I'm actually pretty impressed of how well we did here. Uh, it's very flat. It's pretty rigid considering this is 19 gauge and not 16 and it's not stainless either. So that's another thing. Uh, the detail for the front 
glass trim where it goes down a bit. It, it looks bang on. That looks totally authentic to me. The edges are okay. There's a little bit of hammer kind of dents and stuff there that I think could be sanded out with a disc sander or a belt sander would be a good choice. It's just these corners. Now, I don't think we need to throw out this part, especially since I'm trying to get you guys to be able to do this at home DIY. Uh, I'm gonna grind a little bit of the excess metal and get the corners to look a little better. And then I think if we use some epoxy, some two-part metal epoxy that we could get this to fix up. We'll put some on the outside and on the inside. And on the outside, we'll literally sand it smooth so there's no crack visible, especially after we've painted it. And then on the inside will be all the strength. And it's not a big deal about using epoxy because we have to get some epoxy anyway for the next step, which is basically gluing in some DIY sheet metal J-hooks so that our toggle clamps from inside the cabinet can hold this in place. Yeah, it's pretty good. So let's take a look at what it looks like on the cabinet. With this on the cabinet, you can see it looks the part. It's very flawless and smooth and that angle looks totally perfect. Goes right over the sides like it's supposed to. Nice smooth edges and more importantly, when you're playing it, it actually feels really quite like the original. Feels nice and smooth and easy on the hands. It's just right at the corner that's gotta be fixed up. So I think the next step is to clean up these sides, clean up the edges, take a little bit of a grind off the bottom, kind of true it up and clean up these corners. So I'm gonna fine tune these corners and the edges by the corners with a hammer and a dolly. And this is gonna allow a flat surface for me to hammer those tucks out right up to the corner. And then wherever that crack is and maybe any kind of metal overlap, I'm going to very carefully cut out so that there's not a huge gap there. And then I'm gonna fix that with the two-part epoxy that we're gonna make later. You can see with the hammer and the dolly, I cleaned this up pretty good all the way up to the corner. And you can see that there's a couple of millimeters of overlap in the metal here. So what I'm gonna do is very carefully take a couple millimeters off the lip here, just so that I can squeak this piece of the sheet metal in line with this piece. And then we'll reinforce that with the epoxy. Lockdown bar is all cleaned up and ready to go, except for where we had to grind out there to relieve some of that shrinkage that was going on. So to fix that, we are gonna use some two-part epoxy. This stuff here is called JB Weld. You can get this from your local automotive store. And before I show you how to use that, when you mix up that two-part epoxy, for the first couple of minutes anyway, it kind of is a little bit runny and it will start to sag and drip away from where you want it. So since we're trying to fill a gap in here, we don't want that kind of falling out of there. So what I'm gonna do is use some masking tape and it's gonna go in the backside and act like a dam to keep, keep that epoxy in that place while it hardens up. So I'm gonna do that first. For your two-part epoxy, make sure you read the instructions really well before you start. But in this case, this stuff, it wants you to take equal parts of the hardener and the catalyst, squish it out onto something so you can mix it up. I usually use something that's gonna be thrown away, so a scrap piece of cardboard, and grab something to mix it that can be thrown away like a popsicle stick. And you got a good 
couple minutes that you can aggressively and quickly mix it up really well so that you don't have some spots that don't actually work. And then you apply it to your pieces. You don't have a huge rush. I think this one, you probably got probably 10 minutes before you can kind of start having issues. Uh, it sets hard in four to six hours, and then I would leave this for 24 hours before you do any kind of installation with this lockdown bar. While that epoxy is drying, it's time to make a couple of these J hooks. Now, these J hooks are going to attach to the underside of our lockdown bar, and it's simply just a hook that this toggle clamp can go over, and you got a handle here to be able to clamp down that lockdown bar. Now, these are fully adjustable for how tight or loose they are, so you can make it just snug enough that the lock bar is not loose, yet not so tight that you are bending the sheet metal up. So these J-hooks are for my design. They're gonna be different for yours, and the reason why is it depends on the TV, how far back the TV is, how much space you have in between here and the front of the cab, and how thick that TV is before this toggle clamp is gonna interfere with it. So uh, your design's gonna be a little different, but you can definitely copy what I got just to make it suited for your cabinet. So what I ended up using is three quarter inch wide flat bar and it's one eighth of an inch thick. And I basically have an inch and a half for this flat, flat section. So I have lots of space to epoxy this to the underside of the lockdown bar. And then two and a quarter inches gives me enough far down to clear the TV so that this toggle clamp isn't gonna be interfering with the TV. And then I give myself about an inch to uh, be able to make this hook shape on the end. So let me show you how I made the other one. Okay, you're gonna cut this piece five inches long. Spend a couple of minutes and deburr this thing so it feels nice to the touch. Make a line an inch and a half. Okay, and set it up with the line just above the top of the vise and make sure that your piece is square or 90 degrees to the vise. Take a hammer and hit it just above the top of the vise so that you can bend it over at 90 degrees. Then find something round and solid steel that fits the size of the hook you want to make. I'm using a quarter inch extension to do this job. And all you're going to do is you're going to clamp it in a vise right at the very end of the metal. And then once you've got it clamped tight, you're going to use the hammer to start rolling or rounding that piece of metal over the curve of the extension. And then all you do is you undo the vise, rotate it a bit more, clamp it, and you just keep going all the way around until you get a hook that's about 180 degrees and going back up. Okay, once you got your J-hooks, put it in on the cab and put your toggle clamp underneath and take some measurements to figure out where these are gonna go on your lockdown bar. Keep in mind, you don't want it interfering with your coin door or any of the hardware for it, and you don't want it interfering with your plunger and buttons. So find a spot there and take a measurement from the outside of the cab that you can transfer to the underside of your lockdown bar. And then take your measurements and measure from the edge of the lockdown bar and make a mark for where you are going to epoxy this down. Okay, it's been 24 hours, so I'm gonna peel the tape off and clean up with 400 grit sandpaper, clean it flat this way, clean it flat this way, and then I might even just kind of hand sand that radius to make sure that I don't very quickly go through the epoxy and have like a flat spot instead of a nice radius corner. And then about the only other thing I need to do is test fit it on the cab. If there's a bit too much epoxy right in the corner of the cab, I might either have to grind just a touch out or an even easier solution would be to take the corner, the very top corner of the cabinet off with a file or a rasp or any kind of air tools you have just to get enough of the radius that it can blend in with the epoxy. There's the final result of our corner that's been repaired with epoxy. You can see that black line is the only thing you're gonna see. And in order to see that, you gotta get right down on the front of the cab and take a look from about like six inches. And keep in mind, we have to paint this because it's mild steel, so you're not even gonna see this at the end anyway. Cool, let's move on.
It's time to epoxy these J-hooks in place. Now keep in mind that you are going to have to make sure this is very, very clean. I would probably scuff it up with at least 80 grit sandpaper. Same thing with on the lockdown bar where you're gonna attach this. And then I would use something to clean the surfaces really well. So I'm gonna be using some brake cleaner because it doesn't leave any residue. Or if you happen to have some wax and grease remover, that'll work really good too. Essentially, you just wanna make sure the surface is very clean so that this epoxy has something to stick to. So those J-hooks are now epoxied in place. Keep in mind that this has got to sit for about 24 hours undisturbed and for the first four to six hours, they're kind of still runny and goopy. So I would check this with a ruler, make sure that it's right before you leave it. And when you're applying the epoxy, uh, keep in mind that you get 5,000 pounds per square inch. So I kind of tried to feather this out a little bit from the bracket to get a little bit more adhesion. And if you're designing your bracket, you may even want to make it a little bit wider and bigger so that you get more grab with that epoxy. So, see you in 24 hours. All right, it's been 24 hours and these J-clamps are now nice and tightly attached to this lockdown bar. So, the next step is figuring out where those toggle clamps and little spacers that we need to make. So let's go look at the cabinet for that. To figure out where these toggle clamps have to go, you have to have your Playfield glass trim installed and you have to have your stainless side trim kind of on top. It doesn't have to be installed yet. We're gonna do that in a future video when I do the glass for the cabinet. But you need to have that there so that you can figure out where the height needs to be when you put your lockdown bar on top of that. With these toggle clamps, you've got some adjustability about two inches where this U part of the clamp is gonna be. So what I would do is set it for the middle, that way you got roughly an inch up or inch down from where you're going to set it and screw this into place. Now the other thing is I would not put this right against the inside of the cabinet. You're gonna to wanna to space it out a bit so that it is kind of more underneath where your J hook is. So I've made up some spacer blocks out of three quarter inch plywood, just lay out and drill the holes for the bolt pattern in the toggle clamp. And then all you're gonna do is put your toggle clamp on, make sure this is sitting down where it would be in the cabinet. And then with the holes in this clamp, you can just basically push the screws with a screwdriver to get the location, take everything off, drill the holes, not through the cab, just enough so that you clear the screw and it'll grab a lot better, and then screw this toggle clamp in. Now when I did a test fit of this lockdown bar with the toggle clamps, it holds down great. However, there's really not much anything stopping it going this way. So it immediately pops off the top of the side rails and then it sits kind of crooked. So if you think about the original design, the lockdown bar and the receiver, it was kind of like a slot with these tangs that went in. And those tangs would lock the location this way and then the pins would actually grab it down. So we're missing that part. So I kind of hummed and hawed of what would be the best strategy and then I kind of came up with something. So if this slip sits on the outside of the cabinet, we just need something to make up the difference in here before the edge of this J hook. So if I measure from here to here, that's an inch and a half. This is three quarter inch plywood. So if I add another piece of three quarter inch plywood on the inside here, that will hit here and so the edge of that J clamp actually acts for locating and keeping it this way. And I just have to make sure I don't make it too big because you won't be able to just lift up at that point. You kind of have to go to the side a bit to get the J hooks to come back and go out. So a little piece of three quarter inch plywood, something like this, cut it to go right where this sits. So I'm gonna do that now. Now that we got these blocks in here, let's do a little test fit here.
And when you're adjusting these toggle clamps, really make sure you're just lightly grabbing it right at the very end of the stroke. Otherwise you're gonna end up ripping those epoxy tabs off. So you can see it's almost touching there. A little bit more, that's it. You don't have to go nuts with this. Nice fit, doesn't wanna slide back because of those blocks. Yep, looks great. So let's do a little fitting with the monitor now. Look at that beauty. DIY, no welding required lockdown bar. It's nice and secure this way, left and right, no play. Looks official, looks legit. That's pretty cool. I'm pretty proud of this considering that we did not have to do any welding for you guys. So next question is what do we do with this? Because this is mild steel, this is going to rust. We have to do something with this. So you've got all kinds of options and if there was no epoxy at all on this thing, I would say go to a powder coater, get them to powder coat this in the color you want and, and what a great time to do all your side rails and your legs and your hinge uh, on the side of the back box to get a themed look for your cabinet. However, I'm 99% sure that this JV Weld is not going to make it through a powder coating oven. It's probably just gonna melt up and have problems. Now, you may wanna speak to your local powder coater. They may have some kind of epoxy that's heat resistant, but as far as I know, that heat resistant uh, epoxy is also less strong because it has ingredients in it to resist the heat. So if you're looking at powder coating, maybe look into that ahead of time before you epoxy it. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can paint this. Now it would be really nice to just leave this kind of like a brushed shiny steel look that would actually look pretty good with the stainless rails. However, it's gonna rust so we'd have to clear coat it. Now, in my experience, if you clear coat raw shiny metal like this, it will look good for a while, but eventually you will start to get spider kind of rust cracks underneath, even though you got the clear coat on it. So not really an option that way. So the next thing is we could paint it. So we could paint it some kind of metallic, silver metallic kind of color to try to blend it with it, or we could just go the other way and paint it a theme color, or I've seen a lot of these that are painted black. And the other thing I've seen a lot of these, especially on things like Metallica cabinets, and I was playing an old Street Fighter one the other day, they have this black coat to it, but it's got like a hammer tone finish, or what I've seen is a kind of like a wrinkle coat paint where the surface is kind of textured on it. And I'm thinking I'm gonna show that with you guys because you may not have gotten this perfectly smooth. You may have a bunch of hammer hits and bumps and things like that. And that wrinkle coat is going to help kind of hide and blend that within the texture. So let's show you how to do the wrinkle coat paint on this. And what I'm using is this VHT Wrinkle Plus. It's a very durable paint that self primes and it gives a texture kind of like a wrinkled look to it, uh, much like the newer Stern tables or the older uh, Data East pinball tables. Now, in order to paint this stuff, I have pre-scuffed up this lockdown bar everywhere I'm putting paint with 400 grit sandpaper. You could also use probably the red uh, scotch Bright pads. Make sure that's all scuffed up so that the paint has something to grab to. And then we need to make sure it is dead clean. So I'm gonna be using some wax and grease remover. Give it a good wipe, make sure there's absolutely nothing on it that is gonna prevent the paint to stick. And then, what you basically do is follow the instructions. You're going to do a light spray. The very first coat is a very light spray. And think of it just getting tacky. Wait five to 10 minutes. Then you do a very thick coat, not so thick that you have paint running all over the place, but it is a very thick coat. Then you wait another 10 minutes. And then the last coat, you do another heavy coat. Uh, try to change the directions that you're actually applying those coats so that it kind of crosses and blends better. And then when you've got the third coat, I would wait another 10 minutes, and then you can actually get a heat gun and use heat to kind of speed up and kind of help cure the, the paint. Here's your 30 second spray painting demo. The first thing you gotta do is really, really shake these up. And I shake them upside down so that the solids will come down as you shake in it. And a tip, if you are shaking it hard enough, you should see the little dents in the bottom of the can. Uh, when you go to actual spray, there is an arrow on the tip, so make sure that you spray it away from your face. You'd be surprised how often people do that. And then when you spray, you do not just push the button and go like this all over the part steady. You go off the part, pull down on the, the nozzle, spray across your part about six to eight inches away. Once you go off the part, then you let it go. And then any other 
other passes, you're gonna go about 50% overlap, same kind of technique. And then when you are done, to make sure that the paint doesn't dry through the nozzle and you waste $20 of paint, spray it upside down and within a couple seconds you'll see the color spray go clear and that's when you know that that nozzle has got no more paint in it and you're good to go six months from now when you go to grab this can. It's a wrap in another video from Way of the Wrench, this time on how to make your very own custom pinball lockdown bar without any welding. Pretty cool. So, what's next? Well, probably a lot of you out there are thinking the same thing, that this looked a lot better when it was shiny metal. However, mild steel, it's going to rust. You've got to do something like paint it. So, probably the next thing we'll do is we will use that hammer form and attempt making a more realistic, shiny version of this lockdown bar which will require some welding. So I'll put out a video for that as well and try to go 16 gauge stainless, make it ultra authentic, polish it up, it'll look great. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about the video, feel free to put them down below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And if you haven't already, why don't you join us on Instagram? That way you can get all the behind the scenes photos and videos that are going on in between the videos. Till next time, take it easy.